Last time we, before the midterm exam, we were talking about probability of error. We derived the general expression how probability of error is calculated. So what we're going to do today, and uh, I think next lecture, is look at the uh, uh, calculation of the probability of error in some examples. You will see that uh, although conceptually it is very easy to understand what you need to do, uh, practically there are very few cases where we can carry the calculations in a closed form. In, in other words, in very few cases we can determine expressions in a closed form. But uh, if you think about it, it's not a big concern for us because you will find out that uh, we can always calculate the probability of error through some sort of simulations. And what I'll end is uh, in this section of the uh, course presentation with some MATLAB code that kind of explains to you how you can do these kind of simulations to determine probability of, of error in cases where it's not analytically practical to do that. But uh, we're going to, as always, start with the simplest possible example and then a little bit more complicated and then, then we'll understand better what the simulations are supposed to do. So here, the first one, I'm going to talk about probability of error of error in binary pulse amplitude modulation. Now, binary PAM is the same as BPSK, right? That's, that's the same thing. If you have a, 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 just two phases, then you end up on a real axis. Therefore, you are not really, uh, you're not really uh, two-dimensionally signaling in two dimensions, but in a single dimension. So how do binary PAM signals look like? Well, we have SM of T equal to A M or just A times, uh, or actually A M times psi of T, where M is just either one or two, because you have two symbols in your constellation. This uh, psi of T is our basis vector, and it's going to be one over square root of E G times G T of T. This G T of T is the pulse that we use for signaling. In a most uh, simplistic case, you know, uh, suitable for, I guess, theoretical analysis of this type, we can use square pulse. But you know that square pulse is not uh, the best one to use because of its infinite bandwidth. So we can use any other rounded pulses. And this square root of energy downstairs is just to make the norm of this psi of t equal to 1, as we are accustomed to do that in the signal. Now, uh, this, um, uh, so how does our let me just kind of uh, talk about in brief what, uh, because we went through uh, one week without going through this, so let me refresh your memory about the whole structure of the receiver here. This is our system. We have a transmitter. Then this transmitter will select one of those two symbols, SM of T. It will go through AWGN and be corrupted with the noise N of T. And we saw our receiver as consists consisting of two processes. One was our process of demodulation, and the other one was the process of detection. So this is demodulator, and this is a detector. And uh, we said last time that our detection is going to be the simplistic one, where you're going to assign the symbol to the closest symbol in your constellation. This is what we call maximum likelihood detection. And it is also having one important assumption embedded in it, and this is that all the symbols are equally probable, right? And we saw that even though, you know, a priori you, you wouldn't see why that have to, needs to be the case, we saw from our consideration of the transmitter that we actually make it that way through our statistical encoding and through our randomization on the transmitter side. So, so that's our receiver here. At this point, we have what we call R. R is an important thing to us. This is actually uh, the, what is produced by the demodulator. What the demodulator will do is will take this signal R of T, project it along the basis vectors, and produce this vector R. 
Now, in this case, the, it's going to be trivial because we have only one basis vector. So if this is just going to be one either mass filter or correlator. But uh, this is kind of true in general. So in our case here, in uh, binary pulse amplitude modulation, we have S1 of t given as plus a times psi of t. That's our first symbol. And uh, I can write this as a over square root of eg times gt of t. And our second symbol, s2 of t, is going to be minus a times psi of t, which is, just to complete this, a over square root of mg times gt of t. So since I have only two symbols and I have two bits, 0 or 1, how many bits per symbol I have? In this case, 1 bit per symbol. If, for example, 0 comes, I send you minus a. If 1 comes, I send plus a times this. Now, what is this r? r, as I said, is uh, uh, going to be a dot product between uh, whatever comes here out of t and the uh, basis vector. So it's going to be sm of t plus n of t that's our random noise that uh, is introduced by the channel times psi of t and t. This is how we take the dot product. And uh, this separates into two pieces, 0 to t, sm of t times psi of t dt, plus integral from 0 to t, n of t times psi of t dt. Now, the first one here is going to be integral from 0 to t, sm of t, that's a m times psi of t, times another psi of t, dt, plus integral from 0 to t, n of t, psi of t, dt. Now, what is the value of this integral? a m as a constant comes outside. Integral from 0 to t, psi of t, times psi of t is 1. 1, because we constructed this vector to be basis vector of the length 1. So this is just a m. And this is here n, right? The sample of the noise and the output of your matched filter. Last time, actually, we went in detail and discussed the properties of this n. We know at the input, n is white Gaussian noise. At the output, which one is preserved? Is it still Gaussian? Yeah, yes. if you filter Gaussian process, you get Gaussian process back. Is it, is it white? No. Why is it not white? Because there is a filter, right? Yeah. The filter will change its power spectral density, therefore the noise is not going to be white. So I have a Gaussian, if you want, colored noise with a certain statistical properties. And, and if I know it's Gaussian, and all I care really here is is uh, I actually can determine easily power spectral density of the output noise, but since I'm making decision in amplitude domain, I care about the statistics in the amplitude, and I know it's Gaussian, I need to know what the mean of n is and what the standard deviation of n is. So where do we can see the, the, the probability of error in this? Uh, Wait, that will come. Hopefully in the middle of this class will be finished with that. So because, because we have like the, the integration of the We'll, we'll get to that probability of error. I'm just trying to get to the problem first and then let's pose it. Once we pose the problem then we'll solve it. So we, again, uh, I have another question. If, if we, we want to find the, uh, the dot product of R, so it will be after the demodulation, right? Which one? That's that R. R? Yeah, R is uh, located in the, that's located in the after demodulation, so it's after Correct. the... Uh, Correct. This is a single number. But what I'm saying here, it consists of two numbers hidden. One is a m, which is either plus or minus a, mm -hmm. and the other one is the random component that is added by the champ. So we, we need to find that n? Yes, we, we need to actually pose the problem. And, uh, is that a vector n? No, because remember here, uh, we're, what dimension is the signaling here? Two. One, one. one. Oh, one, one dimensional one. signal. Yes. So everything, even though I write it as a vector, Everything is happening on a, on a scalar, on, on a real axis, right? 
the formalism is the same. And we're going to do exactly the same thing once we get to that two-dimensional signaling. But then we're going to get two, R1 and R2. And in multi-dimensional signaling, you're going to get multiple of these numbers. Right? But here, since it's a one-dimensional signaling, I'm going to get just the scale. And then based on this, what the value here is, I have to make a decision. Was it plus A or was it the minus A that has been sent? And this helps me. This confuses me. Right? And the question that I need to answer is how confused the decision-making process is going to be in the end. That's going to be our probability of error. So what do we know about this N? So properties of N. I know that the expected value of N is what? Zero. Zero, zero right? Right. Uh, I know, in addition, that the expected value of N squared is equal to what? N zero over two. N zero over two. Zero. Beautiful. So this is your second, uh, this is a variance. Actually, second moment, but at the same time, the second central moment, because the mean is equal zero. to zero. And in a, since I know the two uh, moments for a Gaussian variable, I can write the PDF of n. Easy, right? Because Gaussian variable is characterized by its mean and standard deviation. So it becomes 1 over square root of pi n0 equal to the minus n squared over and zero for every n, right? So that's the probability density function of this random variable. That's the that's the one that we are that uh, that will actually confuse the decision making process. So now that I have this, let's formulate the problem. Probability of that. I can say something like this: probability of error is equal to probability of sending a symbol S1 times the probability of making an error given that S1 is sent plus probability of sending a symbol S2 times the probability of making an error given that S2 has been sent. Right? So that's, that covers all the bases. I can either send S1 or S2. And when I send S1, I can make the probability of error given S1, or I can make a probability of error given S2. Now, our assumption was what? That this is one half, right? Probability of sending S1 is the same as probability of sending S2. So this is one half of probability of E given S1 plus one half of the probability of E given S2. <coughs> so let's do some drawing. Excuse me, Professor. Go ahead. I still didn't get it. How, how did you get the one half? Because that's, that's our assumption, right? You're signaling. You're sending either S1 or S2. And what I said is uh, we're going to assume oh. that its probability of sending a 0 is the same as probability of sending a 1. Now, you may ask a legitimate question, why does that have to be the case? And then what I will do is I will refresh your memory and say, hey, remember that what we, what we do at the transmitter, we do statistical encoding. What statistical encoding does, it actually equalizes probability of one and zero. Remember? Mm -hmm. Because if, if you do statistically encode your transmission, you're going to send the same number of zeros and ones. There are some cases where we don't do statistical encoding. There are a lot of cases where this is not done. But to make sure that the probability of ones and zeros is the same, Frequently on a transmitter, you would say you would see that whatever comes out is convolved with the PN sequence, right? Known PN sequence. And what that does, what is the one of the main properties of the PN sequence? It has the same numbers of zeros and ones. The difference is only one. So we actually, even though this this assumption here seems a little bit artificial, we actually make sure that that's the case by uh, by configuring our transmission problem. So, so here's what our axis is. Now, where are our constellation points? Our constellation points are here and here. This is your minus A and plus A, right? So, at the transmitter, when, you, when the signal leaves the transmitter, it's either plus A times psi of T or minus A times psi of T, one of those two. So, it leaves this point and leaves this point. That's where I'm throwing the dart. So, if I look at, let's say I'm throwing, uh, dart towards A, 
majority of times I'm going to be, let's say, here, but there will be spread, right? That spread is going to look half. It's going to look shape. like this, right? right. What, is, what is introducing this spread? It's mm -hmm. the fact that I'm adding to either plus a or minus a, I'm adding a random component n. n has a zero mean. That's why this is centered around a. Mm -hmm. But it has a variance that can be larger or smaller depending on what n zero is. For large n zeros, this is very open, you know, has very open skirts. For small n zeros, this is very tight. Right? The, what happens on the plus a side happens on the minus a side as well. So you can think of another Gaussian curve that looks like this. Right? They should be the same. It's just the final All right, so let's take a look at, uh, let's assume that I'm sending S1. S1 is this guy here. If I'm sending S1, what is the probability of making an error? Well, the probability of making an error is when I interpret S1 as being S2. So what's probability of this happening? Well, here's my decision boundary. As a matter of fact, it's just this point. But I'm going to draw a line for a clear understanding. The decision boundary here is just a single point because we are in a, in a one-dimensional space. So probability of making an error, given that A is sent, is this. Right? Because every time I, I send A and I'm received right of this point, I'm going to make the correct decision. So probability of making an error is going to be I'm sending A and this noise skews me so much so that I fall on the other side of this point. That's when I'm making an erroneous decision. Likewise, if I'm sending minus A, probability of making an erroneous decision is going to be uh, the area under this curve that is right from this point. Here. So, um, let me write out these two probability density functions and actually formulate the expression for probability of error. So PDF of R, given that S1 is sent, which is I'm kind of talking about the distribution of these uh, cross points, uh, given that uh, this one is sent, is going to be 1 over square root of pi and 0 e to the minus r minus um, a squared over n zero. PDF of r given that s2 is sent is going to be 1 over square root of pi n zero e to the minus r plus a squared over n zero. So those are the two conditional probabilities. This is a PDF of R, given that S1 is sent, they should be of the same height. So let me make that. This is PDF of R, given S2 has been sent. <coughs> Therefore, the probability of error becomes. Probability of error becomes one half integral from zero to plus infinity. This is this uh, from zero. This tail over here, the one that I didn't uh, didn't shade. From zero to plus infinity of one over square root of pi and zero e to the minus r plus a squared and zero dr plus one half integral from minus infinity to zero, one over square root of pi and zero e to the minus r minus a squared and zero dr. Right? So that's a probability essentially of receiving S1 given that S2 has been sent. And this is a probability of receiving S2, given that S1 has been sent. Okay? Now, it's easy uh, to see just the symmetry of this. I should have been maybe earlier. 
that these two are the same, right? It's, the, it's everything is symmetric, so these two integrals are the same. So you have one half of, of something plus one half of that same thing, right? So what is it? It's the, it's the, the whole thing. So this I can calculate, for example, as an integral from 0 to plus infinity, 1 over square root of pi and 0 e to the minus r minus a squared over n0 dr. Now, uh, this guy you recognize. This is our good old friend, right? Normal distribution, Q function, and all that stuff. The r plus a. Uh, so again, upper, upper r plus a. Uh, plus. I can. Uh, I just kept this. Oh, oh, sorry. You're right. You're right. Minus minus. minus. That's what. You, sorry. Sorry, because I'm I'm actually writing for the shaded area. Right? Minus. So how do we solve these integrals? We normalize, and then we use Q tables. You know that's uh, how our parents used to do it too. You know, probably your calculator has this function, and I encourage you to read the user manual for your calculator. So let's uh, let me actually go through the two-step process. Substitution. And substitution is going to be let me, r equal to uh, x, sorry, is going to be r minus a over sigma. All right, what is the sigma in this case? This thing here, n0, this is 2 sigma squared. Right? Remember that our, our uh, normal distribution. So what you find downstairs is. Uh, Variable minus mean over 2 sigma squared. So 2 sigma squared is equal to n0. Yeah, so therefore, uh, sigma is square root of n0 over 2. So it's square root of n0 over 2. Square root of n0 over 2. Once you introduce this substitution, what happens to that integral? It becomes normalized to the 0 mean and unit variance. So um, dx from here becomes dr over square root of n0 over 2. Therefore, dr is square root of n0 over 2 dx. So our probability of error becomes an integral. Now, when r is in minus infinity, where is x? R is in minus infinity, where is x? Minus infinity. minus infinity. So this becomes minus infinity. R goes to 0. So when r is 0, this is minus a over square root of n0 over 2. So it's minus a over square root of n0 over 2. This stuff here is 1 over square root of 2 pi e to the minus x squared over 2 dx. Notice how I just wrote this. I don't have to do anything because this, you know, in terms of change of variables, because I know that this particular uh, substitution turns the sub-integral function into zero mean unit variance Gaussian distribution. Right? This is zero mean unit variance of unit standard deviation. <coughs> so, so that's what I need to calculate. At this point, we like to draw what is it that we are trying to calculate? Here's our normal distribution. I need to calculate this. This point here is minus a over square root of n0 over 2. This is x, and this is our PDF of x. So this is probability of error. And you know, in, in my, uh, my work, I always uh, 
I guess I'm trained by my calculator, which has upper tail over normal. So I always calculate this as an upper tail. So I would say this is equivalent to this graph. Where this is now a over square root of n0 over 2. And this is, this is my probability. Um, so, I'm going to say now that this probability of error is going to be upper tail of the normal distribution when mu is equal to 0, sigma is equal to 1, and the value is square root, oh sorry, a, a over square root of n0 over 2. Sometimes, you know, and we have now the same sort of confusion I think we had earlier in, the, in this class or maybe other class. Which one is upper tail, which one is lower tail, which one is Q, which one is Q complement, and so That's PCS. On. Yeah, okay, but that happens in pretty much every class, right? So, so uh, I'm going to start using upper tail and lower <coughs> tail and then you should actually be fluent and able to use whichever table is at your disposal. Now, what you need to make sure is that whenever you use the table, you figure out which one is and then adjust it properly. It's, the, the thing is trivial, but, uh, but, uh, 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 but uh, you've got to be careful. Now, your book uh, gives you, uh, I think, Q function as an, up, as an upper tail of the normal. So, in the book, <coughs> I thought I had a page here, but you can find it easily. It's in chapter uh, 4. Q of z is defined as 1 over 2 pi integral when z goes from, uh, from z plus infinity, and I think e to the minus x squared over 2 dx. And I wonder now if this is maybe square root of 2 pi. Does anybody have a book? Yeah, just a book. It's, it's, on, it's on a page 152. Let me see what it says. It's on a page 42. It's a. Uh, yeah, the QT upper and lower teams. So what is it? Can I can I have it? For? So I just want to make sure that I don't mess up. There you go. So it's 1 minus 5. So it's yeah. upper tail normal, right? So this is square root of 2 pi. So it just says that, that's why I'm checking. So this is how they define Q of x. Uh, Q of z. Or, or they, they, let's just do the, how they use it. Q of x, and this is from x, and they use t here. T, t. This is what book calls Q of x. Q of x in the book is upper tail of the normal distribution. Sometimes it's called complement of CDF. Because if you look at lower tail, it's, it's, actually, it's actually CDF. So this is a CDF complement, or upper tail of the normal. Uh, there, are, there are several ways how this is calculated. Uh, uh, I guess there is a, uh, how do we calculate? Q of S, Q of X is calculated first using tables. And one such table is given on, on, on page 152. 
then uh, there are some useful approximations. One of them is Q1 of x is approximately 1 over square root of 2 pi x e to the minus x squared over 2 for x greater than 0 0.75. And the second useful approximation is that uh, uh, the Q of x is approximately 1 over square root of 2 pi x e to the minus x squared over 2, 1 minus 1 over x squared. And this one is good for x greater than 2. So these two guys sandwich the actual q of x. Uh, if, uh, if you look at it, uh, it's always going to be, q of x is always going to be slightly uh, larger than this one, and, uh, slightly larger than this one, and slightly smaller than this one. So it's always going to be sandwiching between the two. And as I said here, the the many calculators have this function already built in. So uh, feel, you know you should explore. And since it's so useful and used in so many different uh, uh, in so many different areas, you should you know figure out what is the best way for you to be calculated. Okay. Any questions here? What is that notation? Up T N U P T. Upper tail. Upper tail. Upper tail. So this is, you know, up T N means upper tail of normal distribution. <laughs> I think that's the sign whenever you want to use it in the, on your cake later. Yeah, UPTN. many calculators call There's it upper tail on UPTN. UPTN, right? Okay. So that's why I'm giving you giving you that. MATLAB, however, calls it uh, uh, CCDF or something. Uh, it's, it's a uh, calculator. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So now that I know Q, then I can say probability of error in B, BPSK or binary pump is given as upper tail normal of, of uh, this value here. So this becomes Q of A divided by square root of N0 2. Now, I can say, write this slightly different. I can write this as a Q of uh, A squared over N0, put 2 here and take the square root of this, right? You agree that this is the same. Now, what is A squared? The energy. It's the energy of my constellation, right? Because I have two symbols. Each of them have magnitude of A. So energy, average energy of the constellation is, uh, uh, all of the constellation symbol is A squared. Two epsilon s over n0 is what? It's the inverse of the power spectrum of the SNR. No, no. Two epsilon S, 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 S over S zero. S N R. It is an S N R. It's an output of your match filter. So I can write this as a Q of the square root of S N R. And that's the easiest way to remember this, right? So in the case of the BPSK or, or binary pump, your probability of making an error is the Q function of your square root of S N R. S N R, you know. And then SNR is 2 epsilon s over n0. So it's very easy to kind of remember. All right, so that's uh, the easiest case. So let's extend this into a little bit uh, more complicated case. So, so far we just looked at binary pack. You know, the next one, we're going to still keep it one dimensional, but instead of having just two <coughs> symbols in our constellation, we're going to have N. This is our memory pump, and we know that common types are, you know, four level, eight level, 16 level, and, and so on. So, so let's take a look at the probability of error.
in and my files Here, SM of T is going to be again AM times psi of T. It's a one dimensional signaling, but now this M can take values 1, 2, all the way to capital M. Typically, M is equal to 2 to the N, where N is the number of bits that I'm going to use to encode on a given symbol, right? Since we're going to encode N bits at a time, if we, if we chose if we choose n to be equal to 1, we're back where we started with a binary M. If we choose n equal to be 2, then m is equal to 4. I have 4 levels, n equal 3 gives me 8 levels, and so on. This psi of t, just for the sake of completeness, is, a, is 1 over square root of energy times gt of t, where gt of t is some sort of pulse, and the square root of energy normalizes this pulse to be of a, of a unit norm. Now, um, after, so, so how does the constellation look like in this case? Well, here is our psi, here is our zero point, and here are our, so this is, let's say, A, B, A, minus A, minus B, A and so on, right? We can, this is an example, for example. This is example for level pulse amplitude. So this is our constellation in this case. You still have, uh, you still have uh, one dimensional signaling, so all the points would line up on a single real axis, but you have more, more points. Now, when I start tossing you know, my dart, you, I, you can see right away that there are two different kinds of points that I have here. There are these inner points where I can make the mistake in both directions, right? If I, let me just number them. Let's call this S1, S2, S3, S4. You can see that when I'm sending S2, I can easily interpret that as either S3 or S1, right? Because I can be wrong in either direction. I can, in extreme case, I can send S2 and interpret it as S4, but, you know, for most communication, you neglect that possibility because that means that the line of the communication is completely broken, right? You are most likely to go to the adjacent symbols. So for these points, S2 and S3, you can make the direct error in both directions. For the point S1, you know, if I end up S, however far I get this way, I'm still going to be interpreting that correctly as being S1. So if I were to draw, the, uh, there are, I can say there are two cases, two cases to consider. Case of an inner point or midpoint, as I call it in the notes, where you have here S i, and uh, you have this decision boundary here. Actually, these are decision boundaries. So I have these two tails to take into consideration. So this is my inner point. Or I have a case of a an outer point, let me call this S or N point, S E, where this is, for example, probability of error. This is this guy here. And uh, uh, so let's say S M, and this is here would be S M minus 1. Right? So uh, I can I can make decision uh, erroneous only in one direction. So what we need to do now is this is endpoint. Carefully write the equations for all of these cases, sum this up, and see what what comes in the end. <coughs> so let's uh, first tackle the easier task. An easier task is this one because with this one we already 
kind of tackled when we looked at BPSK, because BPSK, BPSK doesn't have inner points. You have two end points, right? Just uh, uh, one on the left and one on the right. So let's first tackle this one, and then I'll go and tackle, tackle this one. What is the relation between palm and BPSK? Well, two level palm is the BPSK. same as BPSK, right? That's where they meet, right? Just like QPSK and four level uh, QAM is the same thing, right? There, there, there are these modulations. Sometimes, you know, uh, there are modulations that that fit in multiple categories, right? So BPSK, it's binary shift king. You have Zero and one eighty degrees, yeah. but it's the same yeah. as uh, as yeah. being you know binary pack, right? With the two amplitude levels, one positive and one negative. So is that BPSK is two dimensional of power? No, BPSK theoretically speaking is two dimensional because it's a part of the PSK modulation scheme, right? right? But because you're essentially modulating your sign with zeros. It's a degenerative case of the two-dimensional signaling, where you have two dimensions available, but you just signal across one. Uh -huh. Right. Now, rarely you will say binary pan, just because I think because uh, uh, it's uh, more difficult to say than BPSK. Right. So most of the time we say BPSK, right? which is the you know, same as binary pan. <laughs> so probability of error for n four. Now, what is the amplitude level for n four? Since we have a symmetric in symmetric. pulse amplitude modulation, which is practically the only, the only types that we actually use. Meaning that uh, you know, what you see on the right hand side of zero is the same as what is on the left hand side of zero. Your AM is given as 2M minus 1 minus capital M times A, where M goes Think one, two, one, two, all the way to n. So if I substitute to get n point a m, then it becomes two m minus one minus capital M times a, which is m minus one times a times a. Uh, let's check if I have four level palm as I have it over there, and I substitute four minus one, I get three a. Right? For eight level, this would be three uh, uh, a, five a, seven a. So if I have eight minus one, seven times eight, and so on. Right? So that's a. Uh, this is this was missing from the notes, and I was trying to figure out is it starting from zero or from one? So it starts from one. So. Um, I have uh, the output of uh, of my matched filter, I can put it here. and the output <coughs> of matched filter. Your received value. I'm going to write it just a scalar because it is a scalar. It's going to be n minus one times a, which is our a. N plus n, and I know that this n is uh, normally distributed with zero main, mean and sigma equal to square root of n zero over two. Right? This is what helps me make the decision, and this is what confuses me. And I know the, the statistics of the, of the norms. Right? So let's uh, draw picture here. So this is my endpoint AM. Here's the previous point. What's the distance between these two? 2A. 
that's D is equal to 2A. <laughs> <laughs> because if you look at here, if you look at, you just even look at that example here, we separate the points by 2A. Now, here is my probability density function of, uh, this is PDF of uh, R, uh, which is 1 over square root of uh, 0 pi e to the minus R minus A M, or this is capital M, A capital M squared over N 0. What is the decision boundary here? It's decision boundary is A away from the AM and the probability of making an error is an area under the curve past this decision boundary here which in this case is a single point. So in our case I can say probability for N point of error is going to be integral from minus infinity of uh, a uh, m minus 1 plus a, or I could have written, uh, let me just, since I reference it to the capital M, I can write this as an integral from minus infinity to a m minus a, from minus infinity to this point here, of 1 over square root of 5 and 0, e to the minus r minus a m, square over 2, no, there's no 2, over n0. So that's the integral that I need to evaluate. Now, uh, I introduce the substitution. Uh, x equal to r minus a n over n0. That's a uh, Oh, sorry, square root of n0 over 2, right? I introduce a substitution which is variable minus mean divided by standard deviation. So that turns this integral into the end probability of error. It's going to be equal, let me leave the boundaries for a second, and this becomes right away 1 over square root of 2 pi e to the minus x squared over 2 dx. That's always normalized PDF. Now, when R is in minus infinity, where is X? Minus infinity is wrong. And then, where R is equal to A M minus A, where is X? It's going to be A M minus A negative minus A M. So it's going to be negative A over square root of N0 over 2. So this is negative A over square root of N0 over 2. So that's, that's what I can uh, put it to. So it's minus a over square root of n0. What is a m minus a in the? That's this, this point here. This point is a m minus a, right? That's our decision boundary, right? Because if you are right of this, I'm going to make a decision that it was a m that has been sent, which is a correct decision, right? If I throw the dart and I fall to the left of it, I'm going to be making the erroneous decision. So probability of making erroneous decision is the area under this, this PDF from minus infinity to this decision point. Right? And that's what I have here, right? that decision point. And then you know, when you do transformation, you end up with this. Now, following my, uh, the, the same consideration that we have before, you end up with the probability of, of n error is going to be equal uh, this I can turn around and then say that this is an integral from plus a over square root of n0 over 2 to plus infinity of 1 over square root of 2 pi into the minus x squared over 2 dx. And we recognize this as being q of a over square root of n0 over 2. Right? Upper tail normal. Okay? Now that I solve this one, then I look at this guy carefully. And I say, well, if this is 
how far is this decision point? Same. This is A away, right? And this is A away. So if I have the same N, then you can see that, uh, that these two tails, that each one of these tails is the same as that tail over there. So I have that the probability of midpoint or inner point of error is equal to two times Pn. Right? Because you can make the decision, uh, the erroneous decision, two times more probable than in the case of, of, uh, of the end point. So now, I have an uh, average probability of error, so P over R is going to be 1 over M times M minus 2 P inner plus 2 times P N, right? Because you have n minus two inner points and uh, two end points and total m, right? So you sum all of these probability of errors and define them by m to get the average. Okay. You didn't do the uh, dr, dx, dr. We don't need to. I mean, you can, you can, right? Uh -huh. But as soon, you know, I skip that step because it's unnecessary. Because I know from many examples so far that if I introduce this substitution. This is what happens. I mean, you can do now. So there's no constant that comes out front. It does. There is a constant that comes, but all of that it cancels, goes, right? All goes away. It goes away. You can try it. I mean, if you if you don't believe it, try it. And I, you know, uh, but uh, the what I would like to for you to to kind of get to the same conclusion that this particular substitution takes care of all the weirdness here and makes this zero mean unit variance. Uh, normal distribution. This is the normalization uh, substitution. It normalizes the subintegral function. Mm -hmm. And then really, you know, when you do these problems, you just say substitution, you write this out, and then you take a pause and you say, okay, let me figure out the boundaries, because that's where all the action is. There, all of that stuff is kind of like a little bowl that you put in. The, the, the head is just the uh, integral and, and uh, uh, Boundaries. That's where, where all the action is happening. Why do we need to calculate the pi inner and then we Because they're different, the right? You see that these points have different probability of errors. The end point has a different probability of error than the midpoint. But the minus 3a and then the constellation of that is still the same. Why, why we need to? Listen, again, this point, you're less likely to make mistake than in this point. Because every skewing of whenever the point is uh, protruded in this direction, you're still making correct decisions. For these points here, you can if, if you go too far to the right, you're making decision. If you're going to uh, erroneous decision, if you go too far to the left, you're making erroneous decision. So the probability of making an error given that these points are sent is larger than the probability of making an error. Than rather than the, 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 the right these side two end points. So, so we calculated first for the end point, then we concluded that for midpoint is twice that, and I'll say, well, what is your average? Right? And on average, it is n minus 2 times p inner, because that's how many inner points I have, plus 2 times p outer, or p end point, divided totally by m. Why does it, whenever you go to the left, it it's will increase the number of uh, probability error there? And then go to the right. Is that the point? No. The point is uh, the point is that these two points have to be treated special, right, or separately than these two points. Because in these two points, you can go to this one or this one. At right. this point, there is nothing to go here. However much your your offset to the left, you're still going to make a correct decision. If I want to determine which is minus 3a and 3a, which one is the uh, larger probability of error? So uh, I need to calculate with this one? Yeah, that's what we're doing. We're actually uh, successful here because we have a closed form expressions in every single case. But why we need to, to pop the pn? Because, it, because it's 3a and minus 3a? Because of that? Because there's only one neighbor versus two neighbors. 
Yeah. You want one neighbor like, versus two neighbors. I mean, yeah. like, if you mess up with your second neighbor. But what is what is exactly your question? Why why are we calculating what? Pi pi inner. There's a p. We're not. We just conclude it's two times p out. We didn't calculate. I actually saved you a whole board of derivations, right? Yeah, but 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 the question is actually what where where does it come from? I mean, like you you got the is. Oh. Where does it come from? Because it's twice, right? These two tails is is equal twice the single tail. Okay. Right. So it's twice larger. So we didn't really calculate. We just observed and we say, oh, since we went through trouble calculating this one, I looked at this one and it's twice. So I just put two. But after that, you use that into. After that, of I get this general one that says probability of error is sum of individual divided by the total number, right? So I have two endpoints and n minus two inner points, and I'm just doing arithmetic average of them. Right? So I sum them all, divide by total number, and I'm going to get the average probability of error. Uh, again, I can do this because the probability of every symbol is the same. They're all equally probable. Otherwise, I would have to weight every particular error with its probability of occurrence, which is probability of sending that particular symbol. But since they're all equally probable, I, this just translates into simple arithmetic average. Now, I can substitute the result that I have derived from before. So this is 1 over n, n minus 2. For inner point, uh, I can say that this is uh, 2 times pn plus 2 times pn. <coughs> And uh, this, let's see, if I take Pn on the outside, then I have n minus 2 times 2 plus 2, right? So this ends up being 2 times n minus 1 over n. Uh, times Pn. Or P, which is 2 times n minus 1 over n times q over a divided by square root of n0 over 2. So that's a closed form solution. Now, that's a, uh, uh, I guess this is an accurate expression. It tells me, you know, probability of error. Uh, it is rarely used or in this form because we like to relate everything back to energy. As a matter of fact, what we like to do is relate everything back to average power. So commonly this is given in a slightly different form. It's equivalent, but uh, you will find it in, uh, in uh, many books expressed differently. So let's show what these forms are uh, and uh, kind of draw uh, how this is commonly found in the books. So, average energy for pulse amplitude modulated signal, average energy is going to be 1 over m sum when m goes from 1 through m energy of the m symbol, right? So, I'm just uh, uh, getting the average of the m symbol. Well, this is equal 1 over m sum when m goes from 1 to capital M. Uh, this guy here, f energy of that uh, is integral 0 of the 0 to 2. And then I have 2m minus 1 minus m times a times psi of t quantity squared dt, right? This is the energy for the nth symbol. And then I'm summing all the possible n energies. And then I divide this by m to get an average energy. This is a dot product of the sn with itself, right? right so that's what uh, this turns out to be. Now, this can be written as 1 over m 
and then I have sum when m goes from 1 through capital M. This 2m minus 1 times m times a squared can go outside of the integral. So I have 2m minus 1 minus m quantity a everything squared. And then I have integral from 0 to t, psi squared of t dt. Tell me what is this? 1. 1, right? Because it's a unit normal vector. So this is equal to uh, a squared over m. And then I have here sum m goes from 1 to m of 2m minus 1 minus m squared. And uh, I have that this sum here is m, m squared minus 1 over 3. Okay? So now, when I substitute the, uh, when I move up, substitute these two, then you get that this is equal to a squared times m squared minus 1 over 3. Okay? The question is how you get this. Right. And uh, I guess you just sit down and spend some quality time, right? It's just a, just a sum of odd numbers, right? Is there the numerical uh -huh. work? No, yes, no, no, this can be done in a, in a, just, a, it's one of those so mathematical means. induction formulas, right? Yeah, yeah. You start from uh, m equal 1, uh, m equal 2, then you kind of feel what it is, and then you say if it's true for 1, one then you demonstrate that it's true for the next one, right? But, uh, just, just try, you know, to get there. But uh, it kind of gives you this, this result at the end. Now, what we, what is cool here is that you get an average energy of the constellation as a function of the number of levels and a, a, a is important to us because a features in this equation here. So by expressing a from here, I can bring uh, my average energy into probability of m. So, uh, therefore, I can say that from here, H is equal to 3 times average energy of M squared minus 1, and then taken square root. So, therefore, probability of error in this case becomes 2 M minus 1 over m times q. And instead of a here, I'm going to write this whole thing. So uh, I'm going to leverage the fact that everything is a square root. You see there's one half here and there's one half here. So I'm going <coughs> to just write 3 average energy over m squared minus 1 times n0 over 2 everything taken square root of, right? What is this? This is substitution of A in here, and then the remaining things are from that expression. So this, uh, this can be, um, excuse me, professor. So uh -huh. the result of average en energy will be this three? No, this average energy is a single number, right? It's this. There's no discrete or continuous, it's one number. Right? Okay. So for a given constellation that has m symbols, this right. is the average energy. And you know the, the, not, uh, if, the value of a? And that's yeah, the you know the value of a, right? So for just test it, if m is equal to 2, which is the case we considered earlier today, binary count, uh -huh. then you have 2 squared, 4, four minus, minus one, one, 3, three. divided by 3, a squared. That's what we concluded earlier today, average energy for binary pen. So binary pen is included in this as it should be as a special case, <coughs> n equal two. As a matter of fact, we could have started with binary, you know, with this, but then you know it's pedagogically not nice to start with the most complicated. Let's just build, you know, as we go. So but this let's let's just express this a little bit uh, differently and we're gonna get the expression that you have in your book for uh, probability of error in a, 
uh, m by pump. So here I can say probability of error is equal to m minus 1 over m q of 6 times average energy divided by m squared minus 1 times m here. So that's a equation that uh, is given in your book. Obviously that 6 is coming from, uh, from uh, uh, the, the 2 climbing upstairs. And what I'm missing here is what? Square root, square root, square root of, of that. Now, another expression that's actually even more common, because what we like to do is express everything in terms of power. Power is the easiest thing to measure. Uh, so we realize this. The average power is going to be equal to average energy divided by symbol time. Right? So that's our average power. So from here, average energy is going to be single period times the average power. So therefore, I have probability of symbol error is going to be equal, or probability of error, let me just introduce it later, is going to be 2 times m minus 1 over m q, and then square root, 6 times average power times the the symbol uh, duration divided by m squared minus 1 and 0, 1 half. Okay? Now, when I say probability of error, what are we talking about? Probability of error of what? Probability of making a mistake in deciding which symbol has been sent. So I'm talking of the probability of a symbol error, right? misinterpreting the symbol. Now, uh, it is common to look everything per bit, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, the question is now, if I make an error in decoding a symbol, how many bits I'm uh, messing up? You know, if I, if I misinterpret the symbol, how many wrong bits do I have? And uh, that answer is, is not straightforward. There is, uh, you know, it depends on how you encode these symbols. There's something called gray encoding. I'll probably spend five minutes next time to show you how it works. But what you need to know is that there is a, at this point, is that there is a way how I can map the number of symbols, in, in number of bits into a symbol, so that my symbol error once results in a single bit error. And the uh, logic is very simple. All I need to do is make sure that I'm encoding my, my symbols so that uh, they differ by single bit. Right. OK, so that's one. I'll, I'll, I'll spend some time next, next time to talk about gray coding. It's, it's a relatively simple thing. But what I would like to do is, is, is uh, uh, what we, another common way how do we express this is to look at uh, the average energy per bit, as a, you know, to express probability of error in terms of average energy per bit, and to do that, we realize, consider that average energy per bit, average average per bit, is equal to your average energy. which is now per symbol, divided by log base uh, 2 of n, or just divided by n, right? Or log base 2 of n, right? Because for, uh, for uh, I have n symbols, or log base 2 of n, uh, n bits per, per given symbol, right? So if my energy of the symbol is uh, this, then the average energy per bit is this, right? You divide the energy per symbol and, and give uh, by the number of bits that you encode uh, for a given symbol. I think the first one should be E sub E. Huh? E sub B equals. E sub, uh, yeah. E sub B. E sub B average. This one. So this is average energy per bit. 
is whatever is the average energy per symbol divided by the number of bits that you have in this symbol. So if it's an eight level pump, then divide you by three right? because every, every, uh, every symbol is worth three bits. So now if you bring this thing into this equation, we end up um, uh, the probability of error is equal to m 2m minus 1 over m q and then it becomes 6 log base 2 of m times average energy per bit divided by m squared minus 1 and 0, 1 half. Or this is 2 m minus 1 over m q 6 log base 2 of m divided by m squared minus 1 times signal to noise ratio per bit 1 half. Right? For this SNR, D is energy per bit average over N0. A lot of times this is called M0. Right? I'm going to write it as so, you know, we, we, we call this M0, right? Whatever that, uh, you know, it's, a, it's a energy per bit divided by the power spectral density of noise. Right? M0. M0. Right? Or ED over NT sometimes. Remember, remember, uh, 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 so, so just Ebno, right? So this is the, the one that is most commonly called. However, you know, just uh, make sure you remember how you got here, right? Because it's, it's quoted often, but it's just as often misused. Because, you know, you kind of, forget that this what this is, right? So you have to take the symbol energy, divide by number of bits by symbol, and divide by power spectral density of noise to get your M, right? So make sure you kind of, as, as you study this, go through this whole process and then through all of these transformations to understand how this one is. To make things even more confusing, what we do is we express this usually in dB, right? So then you need to convert this back to linear, linear. linear. before you plug it in here, because everything here is in linear. the proper units in linear, it's not linear. But whatever may be the case, here's the end result of this. So this is the graph that you're going to find in every book, and this is what we end up using all the time. On the x-axis, we plot this SNR per bit in dB. You plot your EBNO, or EB over NT on the x axis in DB. And then here, you plot your probability of error, which is, which is uh, symbol error. But if you do gray encoding, that's the same time bit error. So majority of books, they don't even pay attention whether it's a symbol error or bit error, because they assume that you do encoding so that they are equal. Right? And then what you end up here is this. Uh, behavior, right? Where this goes, let's say, you know, 0 0.5 or something, and then it kind of falls off rapidly. What you end up is the family of curves that might look somewhat like this. And this is m equal 2, m equal 4, m equal 8, m equal 16, and so on. These curves are called waterfall curves. Why are they called waterfall curves? Because, because, it looks like waterfall. because they look like waterfall. So they're waterfall curves. I prefer to look like rainbow curves. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> waterfall curves. Why are they important to us? Because they are equivalent, and they are actually the principal uh, set of curves that characterize RDC. Once you get your uh, homework done to this point, 
then you actually don't even have to look what's inside of the receiver, whatever it does. If you have a waterfall curves, what this tells you is, is the following. If your target probability of error is this, let's say this is probability of error, and I'm going to say T, target. Saying I'm going to design my system so it has a target probability of error of 10 to the minus 6 or 10 to the minus 1 or 10 to the minus 3 or whatever may be the case. That's, a, that's your requirement on a performance. This comes from your end user. Your end user can tolerate this many bits per second of error. Then what it does for you, it tells you how, many how does that translate in the signal to noise ratio per bit that you need to provide at the input to receiver so that you can do all of your wind budgets and everything based on that. Ah. Right? This is that number that we quote you know, for example, in the receiver sensitivity, or, or, or that, that we quote whenever we are trying to design a system. You say, if this system is to work properly, we need to provide signal to noise ratio or, or EBNO of this value. And then that translates into this much error, and then you say, okay, if this error is smaller than 10 to the minus 6, then my coding picks up and corrects for it, and, and I have erroneous transmission. Okay. So, and uh, no, not erroneous error frequency. So, so about about this, so we just need to see the table of the P of E and then F and R of B, and then that's it. We just need yes. whenever we want this to is, define. This it. is given in your book. I, I think it's uh, on a page four to twelve. This is in your book. It's figure seven fifty five, and and uh, this is the one that you actually. It's not like, you know, there are figures in the book. Some are illustrative. Some are you know there to kind of help, uh, uh, I guess, bring some concepts. This is the actual of, of a significant value. This is abstraction of this entire math. You know, once you get to this point, then you're happy, right? You don't have to go through this math every time. Yeah, just As a system paper, engineer, right? you say, OK, uh, if I'm to get my system to work at this level of performance, this is what I need to do in terms of the, my link budget analysis. This is the amplifier I need to use. This is how much loss I can sustain. This is how far I can go, you know, and so on and so forth. This is where it helps you make the system level decisions. Okay. Okay. So, uh, so I'm gonna stop here. This is for. Uh, uh, this is kind of as far as we're gonna take it for a, a one-dimensional signaling. What we're gonna do next time is tackle two-dimensional signaling. Yeah, okay. First, we're gonna tackle uh, TSK because it's easier, and then we're gonna uh, talk about how you signal it to get probability of error. Oh wow!